All right, Sophie. at the Merchant Marine Academy, and I'd first like to thank everyone for listening to me tonight, one, and two, um, just uh, talk about mainly the build. So I, I built this robot, and the title of my presentation is Subsea Performance Efficiency in Robotic Applications, um, and I can honestly talk about my construction process for hours. Uh, my <coughs> friends know that, but I'll, I'll save you the, the boringness of that, and I'll get right into, into the construction of it. So how did, I, how did I even get involved in this? Um, it started out in high school. I was on a robotics team. Um, pretty big nerd, but anyway. Uh, so I started out on a robotics team, and, and then I had my time out at sea while I was a cadet sailing on commercial ships, and I got assigned to a cable laying ship. This ROV in the background right here, remotely operated vehicle, is a cable laying inspection and uh, servicing ROV. And I was, I was on board a ship that had this. This is actually on the ship that I was on. And so that's how I got really interested in, in ROVs and subsea research. And so seeing these guys tear it apart, put it back together, I, I started thinking, I've got all this free time, maybe I can spend some of this time making my own, or, or how can I design it? So in this definitely not staged picture right here, you can see me starting the process of going through, looking at what I'm gonna need, what materials I'm gonna need, uh, what, what kind of processes am I going to use? And I discovered while I was out at sea that we have 3D printers on campus, so I figured, how can I put these to good use? We've got you know, these thousand dollar printers, let's use them. Um, I also looked at the hydrodynamics of the shape, um, how can I make that efficient? I looked at using computational fluid dynamics a little bit, some of you might be familiar with that. Um, and then buoyancy power systems, uh, programming, what kind of programming was I gonna need for the actual control process? So I looked at Python, Arduino, and then Linux as the operating system, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, but one of the things I was really looking at here was 3D printing and cutting down on the manufacturing costs. So I started looking on YouTube, Stack Exchange, every forum you can imagine that people have been talking about this stuff for the last 10 years, seeing uh, how I could how I could do it myself. So this is just these are some of my initial models, and you when you see you'll see the design has changed quite a bit. This is a quarter scale model on the on the side here, uh, design that I completely scrapped. The middle one is a model. These are all 3D printed uh, that I used for for uh, testing in the pool to determine the drag coefficient, and then the far model is something I scrapped completely, but it just shows you how quickly I was able to prototype with a 3D printer. Um, so while we were waiting for parts to arrive, once we sort of got under the way with the project, uh, we, we decided we were gonna use the pool to do some practical testing and uh, try to determine the drag coefficient. So uh, looking, looking at these free fall tests in the pool, we had a known distance, and I'm, here I am in the pool with the stopwatch, timing it as it, as it travels that distance, and then uh, pulling out the the design information from the 3D modeling software I was using, uh, we could determine the drag coefficient based on the speed. And uh, the, the first runs with this with this 3D printed model, um, they were they the pool was not exactly a perfect uh, test medium uh, because I think the swim team was having practice in the far corner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but we still got some good results, which I'll go to in just a second. Um, but I, this this first testing impacted my. Uh, my formula or my process for trying to make it more hydrodynamic with future design iterations, which I'm going to get to. Uh, this is actually pretty cool. So I was able to run th this model through uh, computational fluid dynamics software, and in this case, some of you might be familiar with uh, ANSYS Fluent, uh, which is what I was using to test it. And <clears throat> we found that uh, it, you, can, you can run these simulations with relative ease. I didn't have any experience going into this, and I was able to, to, uh, to make this, I don't know if you can see the video, but this uh, little visual depiction of uh, flow going over the body. And what's cool about this, the phenomenon, is uh, this vortex shedding. You can kind of see uh, it moving as it travels over the body. And we, we know that it's not a streamlined shape, um, but it was just still pretty cool to visualize that. Uh, comparing the, the pool results, our calculation of drag coefficient, uh, drag coefficient to the, uh, the fluent, the simulations, uh, we ended up getting 12.3% error, which I was happy with because, like I said, the swim team was having their practice, 
and um, I'm a beginner to computational fluid dynamics. So that was, that was pretty cool to see. Um, these are some more pictures from it. You can see the flow over the body. Again, really cool to visualize this before you actually uh, get 3D printing anything. And here's another one from the top. You can see the vortices forming around the end there. So that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, so then I started thinking about the design and looking at all these images on the web and um, just kind of thinking, okay, how can I be a little bit more creative here? So I started with this very boxy design. It's got four thrusters, um, pipes all over the place, very complicated. I was thinking I was going to do um, some TIG welding and weld all, this is all aluminum, weld all this, this uh, gray aluminum together and I realized that would take me way too much time um, to get those, get those welds perfect uh, would, would be too much. So then I transitioned to this model, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to use a plasma cutter. I'm going to cut out these shapes perfectly, and it's going to be great. And I'll 3D print the rest. And that was also not a good idea. So uh, I switched over to a solely 3D printed model. And uh, this one is very big and boxy. Uh, you can imagine the drive coefficient on that, maybe. I don't know. Um, I couldn't when I started. But uh, the, the, this is the top view of that same model. And this, is, this was a design that I, I liked more because it was all 3D printed, but still wasn't 100% happy with it. So, uh, oh, and I even experimented with, uh, I was gonna direct the uh, flow of the thruster around this box in the middle. So all kinds of crazy stuff going on here as I'm going through the process. Uh, then I got to this design, which I liked a little bit more, a lot less material used. Um, and then I finally came upon this design, which is uh, the design that I'm using right now and what I actually 3D printed. And uh, I'll take this time to explain the, what Doris means. So I was struggling to come up with a name for this thing. And uh, Doris happens to be from Greek mythology, the goddess of the bounty of the sea, or related to the bounty of the sea. So I figured I could do that, and then how can I assign an acronym to that, because it's the military, we're all about acronyms. So it stands for Deep Operation Robotic Information System, but we're still working on the deep part, so we'll get there. Um, so then, once I had the design, I thought that I could uh, begin, begin construction. So I looked at what, what kind of 3D printing I was going to be doing, uh, power, water, uh, the waterproofing, buoyancy, uh, what kind of programming I'm going to be using, and the network architecture, and I'll get into the network in just a second. Um, I'm using a lot of open source software, so that, that's really cool. Um, and let's see, so this is the actual 3D printing. So we've got this great lab here uh, at school, and I've got a five kilogram spool set up, um, and it's just feeding this 3D printer, and I put hundreds if not thousands of hours on this 3D printer. I would sit there, watch the first layer go down, make sure it was, it was good to go, and then I would go to class or whatever. Um, and you can see some of the other, uh, some of the other parts of the build, uh, but it's really incredible what you can do with these, with these 3D printers. Um, again, I had no idea how to use this, like, eight months ago. Um, so just plug in the file and it'll slice it up for you into layers and then it prints those layers. Um, so that was pretty cool. And I'm using PLA filament. If anyone has ever done any 3D printing, I'm sure people in this room have, uh, they know that printing over half a kilogram or a kilogram of plastic can be really tedious and also problematic because maybe the print will warp off the bed, maybe you'll have other heat issues. Um, and so I learned a lot of that the hard way with this but my parts are, where some of them were up to a kilogram in weight. So that, that shows you what you can do with these 3D printers. Uh, this, so then we got into the, the actual construction. And it, th on the left here is the, the rough layout. In the middle is the actual brain. And on the right is uh, some waterproofing that I did. But it might be kind of hard to visualize uh, this, this brain here. So this is actually the computer that the entire uh, robot is running off of. And it's running quite a few programs, which I'll get to. But this is a Raspberry Pi. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. It's incredible what you can do with these things. Um, so I also built this little su uh, surface support box here. It's, it's just got a local area network, a little Wi-Fi router. It's not connected to the internet, um, but it is broadcasting a local area network. And then it's got a battery charger. In the middle there is my, is my waterproof box, which slides down. It might be difficult to see, but this box slides down in top, uh, on top of the thruster in the, the arrangement there. And then on the far right, I've got my battery set up. These are two 30,000 milliamp um, lipo, uh, lithium polymer batteries, and they, it's just plug and play. So this plug right here connects to there uh, for easy access. You can pull it out and then plug it, as you can see right here, into the side of the support box for charging. So that's pretty cool. This is just more into the construction process. You can see the top. And actually, another thing that was really cool about the 3D printing, um, even though the nozzle head is only half a millimeter wide, I was able to get tolerances, or I was able to get as close as 0.25 millimeters, and that, that lid slides right on top of uh, my electronics box within a quarter of a millimeter. So that was really impressive with this machine. Um, and this is some other, some other build stuff there. 
Uh, there's the computer in the background that I showed you. Um, so what can this thing actually do? Um, so I, for the control aspect, I started with Python, and Python is a programming language, and I was able to, using a, an, an open source library called Pygame, create this control program that's got very, very low latency uh, using this flight joystick here. So on the side is two throttles, for uh, left and right, and a middle joystick, and what you do is, as you adjust those throttles on the side, it's read in real time, left throttle, right throttle, forward or reverse, uh, the percentage, so the operator has, has a visual of that, and then also the pitch in the middle, so you pull back to go up, push forward to go down, and the props respond instantly uh, with these little brushless motors that, that are also in 3D printed um, port nozzles, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then also, there's a live stream of the camera with, again, very low latency, even over a 100 foot ethernet tether, um, to, the, to anyone who's connected to the network, and by that, I mean that this box, maybe I can go back and show you, um, this box has got a local area network broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal. And if anyone, their phone, their tablet, their laptop, if they connect to that box and go to the IP address of the Raspberry Pi, my control computer, say 10.0.0.4, .0 .0 .4, <coughs> um, they get a, a live, real-time view of what the, what the ROV is seeing right there on their phone, laptop, whatever. And this has great implications for any clients or um, researchers or anyone who want to come and follow along. And I believe that the router can support up to maybe 72 clients, so uh, that's, that's pretty good. It's not, it's not great, uh, but this is also a cheapo router from Best Buy. <coughs> uh, so continuing on here, here it is in the water, moving around. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this project is still very much under construction, so we're working on uh, getting it neutrally buoyant, and it's very close right now. Um, but again, uh, not only neutrally buoyant, but also horizontally buoyant, and I'll get to the, the three, th three thrusters instead of four in just a second. Uh, here it is in the water, you can see the camera on the front there, <clears throat> and here it is just steaming around. And this is actually at uh, one-fifth motor power, um, so this thing can move quite a lot faster than that. Um, here it is in the water again. Like I said, we were trying to get the buoyancy just, just right, and so we were adding weights to it, and we, we're, we've got it really close right now. <clears throat> Um, so findings. So how is this thing actually efficient? That was the title of my project, right? Um, using our fluid simulations, I was able to refine the shape uh, to, to make it more efficient, and the CFD uh, verifies that. Um, using three thrusters instead of conventionally, you might see six or even more, like ten, on um, other collegiate ROVs or professional ROVs. Um, using three, it does not give you as much control, particularly over the pitch. Um, but this thing absolutely sips power. Uh, right now, it consumes in an idle state three watts, uh, full bore, 180 watts, and using this thing at medium duty for an hour used only 15% of these batteries, uh, 6,000 uh, milliamp parallel batteries. Uh, so extremely efficient. And, and then again, these, these single board computers, they, they sip power. Um, this thing running the, the server for the uh, the camera interface, so anyone who can see the camera, the server for the camera interface, the Python control program, and just its operating system, and the accelerometer, there's an accelerometer and moisture sensor on board as well, um, only draws 6% of the total processing power of this, so very, very low. Um, so again, 15% of battery use for an hour of medium duty, that's, that's pretty good. So what do I want to do with this thing in the future? I'd like to look at powering, powering it from the surface as industrial ROVs are our uh, power uh, for even longer dive times, and I'm, I'm already starting to look at that. Uh, I'd like to add horizontal servos behind the fore and aft uh, thrusters to give the operator greater control over the pitch. Um, I'd like to make a dedicated graphical user interface that anyone can go to on their phone, laptop, tablet, whatever, um, and so that they can see the accelerometer data, a, a, a real visual, uh, visualization of what the ROV is doing. So that accelerometer already produces that data, just making it readable. Um, and then seeing the camera, obviously, and then seeing what the operator is doing in real time and all over the web page. So ideally, connect this thing to the internet. Anyone in the world can view it as well. Um, increase the depth of operation. Right now, that electrical box is basically a void, which is definitely one drawback. Um, but if we can if we can reduce that, that void somehow, then it can, go, it can dive to deeper pressures. Um, or sorry, deeper depths with greater pressures. And then finally, simplifying the operational uh, program on board the computer. 
Uh, Six percent is pretty good, but using Python, if anyone has done any Python programming, uh, they would know that you can use functions to further simplify your programming, so that's what I would like to do. Instead of running through every line of code every single time in like a loop, you have a function, so it just does a function call instead of running through every single line every time. And uh, so we got a little dinosaur, which means something's broken, but um, if you would like to learn more about this project, I have a dedicated website that's got all the information on it, uh, rvdoris.com. And uh, in conclusion, I have some, definitely have some thank yous to, to say. Um, first, to Dr. Perez, who has been extremely helpful, always responds to my emails really quickly, always happy to meet, help me out with the pool testing. And then also my friends. Um, my friends are engineers, and I would be so excited about some little component that I had solved or some, some special little trick that I'd come up with, and I'd call them into my room, be like, hey guys, this is super cool. And they'd be like, this, here, 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 is where it's going to break. So you need to go back and look at that, and they were absolutely right. So I definitely, they're not here tonight, but I have them to thank. Um, and so with that, uh, open up to any questions that anyone might have. So I'm going to go back there. So PLA, it does degrade in water over time, but that's over a very long period of time. So to resist that, what I've done um, is I have sprayed the, the exterior surfaces and interior surfaces with just Flex Seal. And it's basically a rubberized coating over the whole thing. And it, that, I mean, the, the, the one, one thing I forgot to mention is the cost of this PLA for the entire robot um, it weighs 11.3 pounds, is less than $50. So, that, so that's a huge efficiency piece right there. So even if it were to degrade, we could just print another piece. It's, it's not that difficult, uh, one. But two, we do have Flex Seal on the outside to prevent that degradation. Yeah? How do you plan to combat the effects of water on Wi-Fi in the sense that it refracts and absorbs Wi-Fi signals really, really well? Right. Uh, so that's something I am looking into. Um, right now, it's hardwired though. It's got a 100 foot ethernet tether. So there is no network traveling through the water because obviously water would immediately scatter that network and it wouldn't work very well. And even in the industry, they're looking at autonomous vessels because you can't, it's very difficult to communicate autonomous um, undersea vessels because it's very difficult to communicate with anything over a traditional Wi-Fi signal. There is a, there is a, it might be MIT, it's always MIT, but uh, I think someone came out with, with an underwater Wi-Fi. They basically propagate sound instead, um, which is the most efficient means of passing information through water. Um, right now, though, it is still hardwired because that's the way th there'd, be, there'd be tons of latency and you would not be able to stream video unless it was hardwired. absolutely did look at that. Um, so one of the other filaments that I looked at is ABS. So ABS is stronger, um, but it's much more difficult to print. So like I mentioned, I'm just getting started with 3D printing here really. Um, and for ABS, you really need an enclosed, a, a heated enclosure because otherwise the, the temperature fluctuations will cause it to curl off the print bed and all kinds of other issues. The, the nozzle extrusion temperature has to be perfect. Print bed uh, temperature has to be perfect. And unfortunately, none of the models we have right now have any heated enclosure, which is what I've determined, or not, not just determined, but my research has shown. <coughs> you need a heated enclosure to really work with ABS the best. But ABS would be the best plastic for, for underwater uh, operation. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on, your, on your control system, first of all, I think Boeing could use you right now. <laughs> but, um, uh, okay. how much, how much uh, of your own programming do you have to do to tie all these devices together in the graphical user interface? How many, what, maybe in lines of code, or were they all standard components of the, of the set programs that came with the equipment? That's a good question. Um, so the, the open source library that I'm using is called Pygame, and what it does is it provides a user interface for displaying the joystick data. However, there's no way in that program to pass that joystick data along to the other components that use that, that, those inputs. So um, I probably wrote about maybe 100 to 200 lines of code in Python with conditional statements. So for example, if push forward, operate vertical motor up, something like that um, in, in Python code. But 
the, the open source libraries that I used is only for vis visualization. Maybe I can go back and actually I can show you. Um, so the open source library, Pygame, only displays this box right here. That's, that's all that that particular open source model does. I programmed all this myself and then the back end of that as well, passing controls from the joystick um, down. And it goes, it doesn't, this isn't the only piece of equipment on board. Sig if, you, if you're following the signals, they come from the joystick, they go to the router at the surface, they go down the tether, they are received by the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi then parses that data, sends it to the Arduino, which is a microcontroller. The microcontroller has the capability of pulse width modulation, which is what needs to, which is what you need to control brushless motors. Um, so the Arduino then sends the signal to an ESC, electronic speed controller, and it then controls the motors. So it's, it's kind of a complicated data stream, but this particular open source program only has visualization, nothing below. Um, the other open source program that I cannot take any credit for is the uh, camera system. That is a bunch of packages that I downloaded onto a computer just like this, and you just run that, and you have a camera connected, and it displays it on your, your local area network. So, does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Yeah? Total cost and all the, the breakdown of the entire <laughs> build is on my website. Um, re, uh, research and development is it's looking about probably two thousand dollars for for everything. But if I was to repeat this, I could build it for less than three hundred, probably like two fifty. Um, there's a lot of material that I use in learning how to do this. Um, there's just there's a lot of of uh, components. Like I went through two of these because one got wet. Imagine that. Um, so, so there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, figuring this stuff out. But 250, 300, yeah. Any other questions? That's that's the efficiency part right there. No. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time.